Welcome to Stormwatch by Gray Noise Intelligence. Each week, we drop the latest info on what's happening at Gray Noise and Census, take a look at a roundup of important and timely cybersecurity topics, toss out some expert opinions, and drop the occasional conspiracy theory. On today's pod, we are joined by Eclipsium's Nate Warfield to talk about all things firmware, supply chain, and Kev, but we'll introduce uh, Nate a little bit later. Uh, he's going to join the peanut gallery for an in-depth look at a recent spate of big tech trouble in Little China, including APT31 sanctions, warnings on Volt Typhoon and water facility hacks, China going after UK MPs, a foreboding expansion of China's draconian state secrets, work secrets regulations, and our hot takes on the impending doom of TikTok in the U.S., and as usual, we're going to cover our tool time segment, Kev Roundup tags, the whole thing. So it's going to be a pretty good ride today, everybody. And uh, discussing this is me, Bob Brutus, and my co-host. But I, I got I got some background music as usual, so we're going to get this out. It'd be cool. There we go. And uh, Kimber, good morning. Good morning. Are you all rested from your weekend adventures? Oh my God, no, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> Very cool. Um, so we have a fun question. And without I, I I forgot to tell you all this, but like maybe don't divulge the really good ones. But what is the most creative excuse you've ever used to get out of an obligation or a situation? I, I just don't have a good answer for this. I thought okay. about this when you prompted it. And like, I just don't have any fun answer for this. This is such a like hard thing to think of. I'm such a like rules follower. Kimber's just more afraid of spilling her playbook. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot lie. I'm too much of a marshmallow. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Like if you actually go, like that just means you do a lot of things you don't really want to do. Yeah. yeah. Which is not healthy, but Right. That's a different problem. <laughs> it's, it's unhealthy in a different way than lying, I guess. That's that's for your therapist. Right? Yeah. yeah. <sighs> well, that's that, that's cool. Um we 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 will then move on. Uh Emily, good day. Hello, hello. How are you? I, I I am actually doing really well, especially with our green room fun we had before this. Um, uh, uh, are so? How about you? Are you? Uh, what is the most creative excuse you've ever used to get out of an obligation? And remember, you don't have to divulge the really good ones and especially oh, the really recent ones. Yeah, no, I definitely won't. So I'm going to go way back to high school. Mm. Um, I. I've all my life kind of tried to avoid having to do things with people because it's just really tiring. <laughs> and I remember confiding in my mom about this. Like, I was like, mom, I just really, they invited me to this thing. And I just really don't want to go. And she was like, just blame it on me. Say your mom <laughs> said you can't yes. go. And I was like, that's the card I'm using. And I realize I'm way beyond high school years, but I still wish I could use that excuse. Like, yeah, my mom said. What a good mom. Could, what a great yeah. mom. <laughs> yeah, she, she got it. She totally got it. So like she, yeah. Um, I said had. Is it is it had or has? Has. She, she have, yes. Yeah, yeah, you have a great mom. Yeah. yeah. And Emily's mom, if you're listening, you are awesome. You're an awesome yes. mom. Uh, so Glenn unfortunately escaped my attempt to bribe Boeing senior management into causing a small accident to happen during his travels, but at least I had wow. the Illuminati sack them. Like I, like I called up the Illuminati, they sacked them, which is good for failing me. So Glenn, now that you're still alive, um, what is the most creative excuse you've ever used to get out of an obligation or situation or, or meeting with me? Maybe, I don't know. So, well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I wasn't born yesterday, Bob. Um, so does it have to be a lie? No, not at all. It's a creative Cause, cause, excuse. Excuses okay. don't necessarily need to be lies. I don't know why I asked that because it was a lie. Anyway, I'm certain <laughs> none of my family's watching this, so it's fine. Um, there was maybe a few times where I was like, "Yeah, I can't do that. I'm on call in my previous role. Like on call, I got to stay within, uh, you know, like 15 minutes of my home base or something like that to to respond if if needed." So you used your you used your position as a critical defender <laughs> to get out of it. Wow, dude! I did. did no one challenge yes. you and go, "Hey, don't you have a laptop and Wi-Fi?" Nobody I mean, I'll bring the backpack if I need. Okay. Oh, I, would, oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah no, don't. Like, so now that we know this, wait a minute. So now that we know this, aren't you still CISP certified? Uh-huh. Doesn't, isn't this a mark? That this is like, this is a, this is a decertification, like the disclosure. Well, this maybe I can make up with it by knowing the types of fire extinguishers I should use at the right time. This was clearly a Glenn trap, this question. <laughs> I agree. They I all are, that. Kimber. <laughs> <laughs> There's no such thing as not a, a Glenn trap. So, um, I, uh, unfortunately, guests don't get out of this question, Nate. So, what is your most creative excuse? I've got a good one for you. Uh, also, long ago, back when I uh, was not as as uh, not as responsible with a human being as I am now. So, I 
Uh, the job I had, I wasn't particularly a fan. Actually, I worked for F5 at the time, uh, our, our good buddies, F5 Networks. Uh, and I just decided one Monday I didn't want to go to work. So uh, I just didn't. I didn't call. I didn't email. Um, unbeknownst to my boss at the time, I figured out a bug in exchange, which was if you went and made, you could schedule, you know how you could schedule emails to be sent at a certain time? Oh, yeah. Well, in circa 2001, if you schedule the email to be sent in the past, it would still, you could say, this is when I want the message to no. arrive, but I want to send it in a minute. It would send and it would show up with the time stamp in the past. Oh, wow. So I got into work the next day early, wrote this email like, hey, boss, just letting you know I'm not going to be on Monday. I've got a family commitment or some whatever BS that it was and sent it to him so that it had showed up like Friday afternoon. So... He gets in the office, pulls me, he's like, where were you on Monday? Why didn't you call or email? And so I doubled down and I got I right back at him. Why are you tuning <laughs> me up, dude? I emailed you on Friday. You just didn't read your emails. Go check your mail. So he goes in there and pulls me into his office, looks at his mail. It's like, yeah, it's Friday after you did like two something. He pulls it up. He's like, oh. And then he just like completely is like, oh, I'm so sorry, dude. I, I really apologize. I was out of line. And I was like, yeah, man, that was completely out of line. That's like gaslighting with receipts. Oh, yeah. That's yeah, hack. Was, yeah, that's that's impressive. Yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's, wow. That's, I, I, yeah. I wonder if it still has that bug. I was going to say, is the bug know. fixed? When you guys are all using Google Mail. It doesn't matter, right? Yes, this is actually everyone uses Google Mail. Yeah. That's, that's what Not about. the government. Oh, this would yeah. be true. Um, Overwatch, what about you? What is your most creative excuse before I, I before I, I tell you what inspired this question? Oh, again, so we have we have another mm. honest person just like Kimber. And, yeah, I believe, and, and and I believe both of them do. Like they yeah. I could see if they didn't want to do something, they would just tell me or they would just suffer. <laughs> so yeah, that's yeah, it's, that's great. You, guys, you, you guys are great. You guys are great. Uh it, so what like, it's yeah. the best feeling in the world to just be like I don't want to. I'm going to just stay home and not do that. It feels really good. I highly recommend it. <laughs> I, uh, so what, what, like, I'll try, I'll be trying to be brief with this. What inspired this question is I was going through some, it was a really crappy day in Maine on Saturday. It was like a nice storm. So I was doing things I had to do, which was like clean up a bunch of stuff. And I was going through one of the old boxes and it was from my time. At, this is a very long time ago when I was at Johnson and very, very long time ago at Johnson and Johnson. And it, like a bunch of memories just came flooding back. And the one was from uh, one of the, probably the best security people I've ever worked with in my life. Phil, I won't use his last name because I don't have permission. And um, he Donahue. used to just, nope, no, nope, that's no one even knows who he is, dude. Like seriously, you just, wow. That's oh. anyway. Uh, we're trying to shorten the show, not lengthen the show. Dude. So uh, the uh, he and one one of the things he told uh, one story he told was of this idiot he used to work with at a different company who told who gave a really pathetic excuse of trying to get us something at work by saying he had bad ham with cream sauce at Easter time, which is another reason why I thought about it right now. Um, so that whole thing was the catalyst for asking you what your most creative one was, because that obviously wasn't creative, but it made me think of Phil, and if Phil is listening, it's, it, 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 just thinking about you, bud, if, if that's up there. So there is context for things, although it had an added benefit of being able to trap Glenn if he said like something stupid. So that was good. Speaking, so Kimber, <laughs> what you described what is is FOMO to Jomo. Are you familiar with Jomo? Joy, Joy of missing, of missing out? out. Yeah. Ooh, I like that. Okay. FOMO to Jomo. Yeah. One of my favorite things. Yeah. And just one more shout out to Ashley, because the only thing reason why this goes remotely smoothly is because Ashley makes it go there. And if you are joining us live uh, in the comments, please do not hesitate to heckle or provide insights. Great conversation last week. Please drop them here. Ask Nate tons of questions. He's brilliant and he does really cool stuff. And we're going to hear a lot, of, a lot about that. And uh, so and we also have a special welcome to our on demand and podcast listeners, which we are going to unfortunately bring the slides up. For, oh, I have to actually edit the stage right there you go. Uh, mash to like, mash to subscribe. Uh, a lot of great stuff is going to go on today, so please do that. And I'm going to bring up the comments so I can follow along with everyone that's on here. We'll welcome all the usuals. I see all the usual suspects are on board. Um, and I do need to to begin the pod. Um, I found something on, I believe it was on Friday, uh, Friday on Mastodon. Maybe it was Thursday, and I knew I'd have to save it for here because I, I look for excuses to be able to do my favorite thing. Because the hack is on. So uh, this is from Hamid, uh, and I'm not going to try. I am not going to try to pronounce because I would it's be disrespectful because I have no idea. Uh, it's Kashfi. Kashfi. Yeah, yeah. You learn how to pronounce other countries' names, my man. No, no, nah, yeah. I'm I'm alright. It's cool. Um, so I I oh, and we just lost Glenn. Oh boy, this is not. Good. I offended him. Uh, 
it's okay. It happens in reverse all the time. So uh, I think it's long overdue for OWASP to replace their web goat. Uh, hopefully everyone knows what that is. We aren't going to explain it right now. Uh, with Fortinet products. I've been teaching bug bounty hunting to my interns via Cisco and Fortinet products for a few years already. On a few occasions, they found real bugs with only a few months of experience in code review. And I just thought that that was a great idea. You know, maybe use Fortinet for good instead of for evil, like protecting your enterprise. Uh, so uh, we are going to kick it into gear uh, by talking with Nate. So Nate, welcome to the pod. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's good to see some new faces and some faces I've hung out with at conferences that shall not be named. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so could you tell us a bit about A, yourself, and then B, Eclipsium, where, you, where you're hailing from today? Sure. Uh, I'm Nate Warfield. Um, I've been around for a while. I do a lot of conference talks. Uh, I was formerly at Microsoft for a bunch of years, uh, shipping security patches for Windows. Um, but uh, now I'm over at Eclipsium, and what we do is uh, firmware security. And this was kind of a, it was a somewhat of a new world for me. Uh, I haven't, I've, I've been more focused on sort of network appliances and all of our, our favorite targets that we were chatting about, um, Bob, like Fortinet and F5s and stuff like that. Um, but what Eclipsium does is essentially, if you think sort of in a nutshell, if you think of for your endpoint clients, your Sentinel ones, your CrowdStrikes, those live in the operating system, right? They're looking at Windows telemetry. They're watching what's happening on the Windows side of things. What they're not looking at is what's happening in all of the little mini operating systems that run underneath Windows. So you've got UEFI, you've got a little operating system in your hard drive controller, in your video controller, in your BIOS, you've got it in your TPM chips. You've got all these other components inside your computers, your desktops, your endpoints, and even your appliances. Um, that run code and attackers have started to move lower and lower into the stack because of all of the advances we see with endpoint telemetry and all of these other things that have made um, that have made sort of exploitation on Windows has gotten harder and persisting on Windows has gotten even harder, even exponentially harder with all these tools. So what we do is we provide you a way to sort of like look at what the firmware on your machine looks like, verify that it's actually what came from the manufacturer. Um, and then do things like snapshotting it where like, you know, say you are actually selling things to China, you can scan your customer, your sales guy's laptop. If he goes to China and comes back and you scan it again, and maybe one UEFI driver has suddenly changed its hash, that's a signal that you should probably go figure out like what happened while you were in China at you know dinner and somebody was in your hotel room rifling through your stuff. That that's kind of a high level. And we're, we're expanding that into network appliances too. We've been working pretty hard the last year and a half on uh, building what I sort of colloquially call uh, EDR for network appliances to try to be able to to I'd verify the uh, integrity of your firmware and your appliances and also do things like identifying things, not so much whether it's been breached or not so much the exploitation itself because a zero day is hard to detect, but um, a signature that we see with pretty much every attack is things changing on the device. Um, you know, with Avanti, they tried to check this with their fairly broken sort of um, integrity checking tool. Um, our goal is to be better than that and be able to tell you, hey, you know, we don't necessarily know what exactly caused this, but you just had a new PHP file show up in your web shelter, right? In your web directory of your UI. This, right? this is and incredible. You, yeah, because yeah. like you, you are breaking open a black box that every enterprise, like every enterprise had, they have tons of them all over the place. And now you're going to be able to help them understand where all of the gotchas are in all those places. And if anything really bad, this is, this is a really great solution you guys have worked on. Yeah, that's that's the goal, right? We've seen that, you know, I, I did a bunch of research in 2022 uh, on how to persist past uh, reboots and um, formatting and wiping and reinstalling and all that. I, I was targeting Citrix and F5. And then um, it was funny, right around beginning of 2023 with Barracuda, uh, Mandy had noticed that the attackers started burrowing their malware inside config backups. So right around the same time, my boss told me, hey, that was a great research you did last year. This year, you have to build a system that catches you doing what you did. Um, which I probably should have seen coming, but it was like, <laughs> oh, wow, I spent a lot of time breaking things and I did not think through how hard it's going to be to catch me breaking things. Um, but we're, we're doing it. We're getting there. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people don't really think about that vector when they're getting into cybersecurity. Like it's something that there's not a lot of monitoring on. There's not a lot of consideration for like what actually changes on network devices and how can you even monitor that. So I think traditionally people kind of think of it being a supply chain issue. Yeah. That is a vector. It's a weird, scary black box, right? I spent a lot of years as a network engineer and, you know, the security teams did their security stuff. 
And they just kind of left the network alone because partly because people like me would be like, don't scan the network devices. If you knock over one of the F5s that's running Hotmail logins at Microsoft, we take an outage and 30 million people can't get to their email. So the networking teams are very touchy about being probed by, you know, the scanning tools. Um, and so it's just, it's left it, it's left this sort of gap in, in coverage that attackers have really glommed onto, especially in the last two to four years. And because these are full Linux machines, they're basically Linux server with some custom stuff on top. Um, you've got a really good sort of jumping off point, right? You see, that's why we're seeing all these SSL VPN appliances get hit because this thing is connected to your whole network, right? It's not going to be very well firewall because it's like, well, somebody needs to get to the dev network, the finance network, the HR network. So this thing just has limitless access. And now I get on it and I've got Python and I've got, you know, I can then build packages on here. I can run tool sets in here. Um, yeah, we're in my opinion, we're we're only seeing the tip of this iceberg of what, what's going to be coming in the next few years. Does um it's like if if there's any enterprise folks listening right now, um, one of their questions is going to be, especially if they're like a like a CISO level person, how does this not void my warranty, my contract with the folks that I'm getting these devices from? Because they've all told me these are perfect black boxes that never have anything wrong with them and never have security problems. Like how 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 do how do they get around that with this? So right now, what we've there's the the approach that I've taken so far is that there there's some devices that are better that are easier to support than others. The ones that are really easy to support are what I call the ones that give you like a full shell, right? If I have a full bash shell, I can do a lot of stuff. I can do a lot of the stuff is it's, it's mostly like traditional Linux defear kind of work, right? I'm nothing that it's, it's not super advanced. It does. That definitely has to be a lot of domain knowledge of how these devices work. But once I have a shell, I can do a lot of stuff and I can, I can pretty much catch anything you're doing. The companies that don't let you do this, there's, you know, on one hand, there's Fortinet, who gives you sort of a restricted shell. They do have some abilities to look at hashes and, and different things on a file system. Um, those ones are, are sort of the middle ground. And then you've got the ones that I completely hate, which are the Avantis, which don't have any sort of a shell whatsoever. You've got this tool that I ripped apart back in February. And I was like, look, it's excluding half the file system. And then Mandiant comes out a couple of weeks later. They're like, yeah, those are the directories that the Chinese are putting all their toys in is the things that you just talked about. Um, so, so yeah, um, I spent a lot of time taking apart network device firmware, um, and, and trying to figure out how it works, how to, how to build something that won't void a warranty. Right. So we can, I can come to someone and say, yes, you can use our tool on your appliances. You're not going to have your vendors say, oh, well, if anything breaks, you can't call support because, you know, the concept of running a remote agent on an appliance is sort of a slippery slope that we're I'm exploring, but it's, it's that sort of TBD at this point. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, since you're talking about supply chain stuff too, and I'm glad you yeah. brought that up. Uh, I, I, I know this is an older blog post and we're not going to talk about the blog post, but I just I thought was, this was really cool. Mine anyways. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It was a really clever little, little thing y'all did. I just wanted to show it to folks to get, to get the links up there. Just, we want to drive as many eyeballs to what you guys are doing and uh, talk to me a bit more about like, your how you think about supply chain what do you like we have already heard a little bit of what you're doing with that but like where are you where, where are you in ecclesium going to to do to do that yeah so ecclesium's take on it is we are we're really looking at more so i mean the software supply chain and the whole s bomb stuff has been has been talked about for years um we're focusing more on the hardware supply chain side of things okay. right um, I mean, if you remember the ridiculous Bloomberg, you know, the I want to believe pencil with the little chip thing um, where they were saying they were putting you know chips on, I think, super micro motherboards. That was sort of the, the FUD version of what we're actually looking for. But when it comes down to it, um, you know, most of these appliances are manufactured outside of the United States. And I don't play the politics game, but if we look at the way the world is, you've got the United States government saying, ah, oh, Huawei bad, Huawei bad, China bad. It's like, well, where do you think all your Fortinets, all your Palo Altos, all your F5s, all your Citrix devices, where do you think those are assembled? Because they're probably not being assembled in Palo Alto or the Bay Area or even Seattle area, right? This is all being built outside from components being sourced from dozens or hundreds of different companies around like, you know, the Asia Pacific area. And there's, it's very hard to ascertain, you know, how can you, how can you prove that this server you put into your environment or this appliance that you put into your environment, that nothing from the, the time that it's first, you know, chips are being fabricated to put on a board, to fabbed onto a, on, into a machine, to all of these, there's all these steps that go along with it. You know, how do we, how can we ascertain that nothing has been tampered with? Like, how do you know that what your vendor sells you 
is you know because you know they they'll build the machine they'll they'll say here's what it sold us here's all of the the firmware that runs on this thing that comes from the vendor does everybody rack all their servers and check every server for firmware updates when they turn them on probably not right so the alternative to that in our in our take is that you can run our our agent on there it can say okay look you you just put in you know say you've got a data center you just installed you know 10,000 servers as you're building out your cloud capacity you scan all of them and say, okay, everything looks good except for these two over here. They're the exact same model number, the exact same SKU, but they're different firmware on these machines, right? It might just be that they're outdated, but it also might not be, right? And so that's that's what we're trying to look at is, is the firmware basically just, just understanding that the integrity of, of all the components is what you think it should be and that the software running on these firmware components, these hardware components is, is at least valid and hasn't been mucked with, you know, in transit. Yeah, I mean, how does somebody even like start to get get the understanding of like what good firmware versus bad firmware, any of the that stuff? It's just a it's a very specific like set of knowledge that I wouldn't even know how to advise someone how to get into. It's been fun. I've I've been here for almost two years, and I'm like every single day I'm learning something new from the, the folks that have been here since the beginning. We Eclipsium, actually, the the backstory they were the. Um, founded during the eclipse that happened in Oregon a few years back. So hence the eclipse, you know, it, it, I just learned this like a few months ago. And I was like, how did I Dang. not? That better? <laughs> um, but that's where the eclipse part of Eclipsium comes from. So we're about seven year old company um, started by folks that came from Intel that wrote Intel's chipset tools, um, the folks from McAfee. So there's, there's a lot of probably some of the, the largest concentration of firmware security knowledge in the industry started this company. Um, but yeah, it's it's a complex world. And a lot of times we have people saying, well, I already have CrowdStrike. I already have Sentinel-1. Why do I need this? And then I pull out my, I don't know where it is. I have a bash bunny that I'm like, well, cool. I can plop this in your machine. What are you running? Sentinel-1 with BitLocker, Windows 11 fully patched. Click, sits for a few seconds, reboots, drops a Mr. Robot F Society mask as I put a backdoor inside your bootloader. Right, CrowdStrike says everything's cool. Sentinel One says it's cool. BitLocker is totally happy. Right, this is you know that's that's the physical version of the attack. I can send this to you in email. I can, you know, there's there's a lot of stuff that's that's easy to do that people don't realize can still be done because they think you know their their other vendor has sold them the end to end test solution. We cover everything, and that's just not the case. Right, as it turns out, that whole model of like there are layers to things. You know, mm -hmm. OSI yeah. layers, everything yeah. like that. Pretty, pretty crucial. So I'm curious. Oh, actually, sorry, we yeah. have a question. Yeah, I, yeah, something, yeah. Something, yeah but formally does like, uh, just like since we have, uh, we have yeah. usually really great questions from people. Uh, so do you find it difficult to support all the vendors that rely on older and unsupported software packages to run their software? Um, that's a great question. In terms of, in terms of firmware, um, firmware, while it is software, is generally not running old. On, it's not. It's uh, when we look at firmware from like a network appliance standpoint, that's generally where we're going to see older, unsupported software packages, like with Avanti, for example, using like eleven-year-old versions of CentOS. Um, firmware, as you see it on your laptops, your desktops, um, that stuff is very rarely using actual Linux. Uh, it's generally some sort of custom code that's written. Um, it's it has to be very small, like you don't have a whole lot of storage, so it's not running like a full kernel. Um, so that's the support of the support. I'll say yes to the degree that um, network appliances is probably the hardest thing to support just because there is such a myriad of software. There's so many different software packages. Like when I run something through an analyzer, I'm finding thousands of vulnerabilities in the Linux kernel that haven't been patched in that thing. Um, from the desktop and endpoint standpoint, I, our coverage is definitely much better. That's where that's the much more mature side of firmware security. Go for it, Emily. Yeah, so I was gonna like zooming out a little bit. You touched on this kind of where people are like, "Oh, I have something. I want to have CrowdStrike. I don't. I don't need this." What do you say to organizations who feel like, "Oh, this isn't going to happen to me because why would anybody like do something this targeted or this kind of sophisticated?" I hate to use the word sophisticated yeah. because it has all of those kind of connotations to it. But like, who needs to be worried about this from like an enterprise organization standpoint? I mean, I would say that at this point, any enterprise does, right? I mean, if we if we roll the clock back, um, if we roll the clock back 10, 15 years ago, network appliance attacks didn't happen, right? Nobody was hacking into network gear. People were just phishing you. They were just sending you the links to click on. Um, the, the realm of hacking into a network appliance was the nation state toys, right? When the shadow brokers dropped their first leak, 
in summer 2016, everybody was like, oh my God, there's all these zero days for Citrix and or for Cisco and Fortinet and Juniper. Look at this cool set that the NSA built. We roll it forward eight years and you know, every few couple of weeks, there's a network appliance uh, zero day coming out. Attackers are implanting themselves on appliances. The firmware, the stuff on your machine, on your laptops, like your actual like desk laptop, desktop firmware, that is just a world that hasn't been attacked in mass yet. Um, I'm convinced there's probably a lot more, you know, as a startup or a small company, so we don't have necessarily the visibility of like the Microsoft and the CrowdStrike. Right. Um, if I had that visibility, I can guarantee you, if you gave me, if I could put my, my systems and get the telemetry from say Defender and have, you know, 30 million machines looking at their telemetry, I guarantee you I'd be finding firmware implants everywhere. They're out there. Wow. The thing is, is that other companies just aren't looking as low as we are. And like we are still, you know, we don't have quite the, the, the visibility that they do. Um, but if you look at like Cosmic Strand a couple of years ago, Kaspersky found this thing and it had been first published in like 2013 in China. Somebody was like, yeah, there's this weird UEFI backdoor. Nobody noticed it. And I think it was, you know, 10 or 11 years later, Kaspersky finds it. And it's like, oh, look, it's the same thing. This has already been blogged about, right? We saw this Black Lotus boot kit that came out last year where people were like, oh, no, that's probably some script kitty just selling some lies to try to make some money on a dark website. And then a few months later, ESET's like, nope, it's completely legit. It bypasses all these security controls. Microsoft sort of YOLO'd and threw their hands up and said, we don't really know how to fix this. So we're going to let people choose if they want to apply the patch that you can't roll back once you do it and hope that your machines boot after you rebuild all your bootable media. So the problem's definitely there. It's just that the the attackers haven't had the need yet to get that low i know there are attackers going there but you know as 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 things keep progressing as security keeps getting better in other areas it's it's a business for them right it's return on investment what's the most return i can get on as little investment as possible and the other thing that's challenging is because you know i do security research it's sort of the the double-edged sword of what we do is the idea is to make things better make things more secure the thing is, we have to understand attackers are copying us, right? You know, yeah. the techniques that I developed, I just thought it was a cool thing. And I've seen people, there's three different instances of stuff where I was like, wow, they just copied the design of what I did and applied it to a different device. Like, I had a little bit of a, how do I feel about this moment? Um, but I mean, you look at any of the other researchers that have built really advanced tools, like ben Gel Benjamin Delpy, who built uh, Mimi Cats, you know, the guys who built Metasploit and Cobalt Strike and Sliver and all these other tool sets, attackers are like, cool, thanks for the R&D. I don't have to spend my time doing that. People are researching firmware security. People are looking at how to build low level, like, you know, bootloader backdoors and all these other things. They put the code on GitHub. Well, attackers are just going to take it, right? So there's the tool set is becoming more and more accessible to people of lesser and lesser skill. We're lowering the bar for entry while we haven't been raising the bar for security. So what's the, so this is an old debate, right? Like you yeah. touch on like all of these tools, these red team tools, like what is the, like the way forward there, especially in this realm that seems so niche and like, hasn't quite fully exploded yet. Like we think it's going to, but it's not quite crossed over yet. Um, I mean, I know my marketing people are listening. So buy Eclipsium as your, as your security solution. Um, I don't know that there, I don't have, know that there is a good way forward. I think, I think that I don't like to jump into the, the, the um, sort of an offensive security toolkit like debates. I know some folks that are some friends of mine are very people have some very strong opinions on whether or not they should be released, whether or not this is actually like, or are we doing like, is it arms trafficking to give away things like Sliver for free? I don't get into those. I think the research is always going to be valuable. Um, we just need to do a better job at including defensive stuff, right? And I've I, my opinions on some of the way that, um, you know, there's this, I started joking, if you've seen the movie uh, Ready Player One, there's the sort of first to the key, first to the prize. Um, there's a lot of companies out there who I won't name, so it's first to the pock, first to the prize, right? And a, a patch comes out on Thursday, you've got a, 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 an offensive security company is like, hey, let's just drop the full weaponized pock on Sunday afternoon. And then, oh my God, the internet's melting down with exploitation Monday morning. How did this ever happen? Did you drop any defensive guidance with the POC? It's always that there's this mentality of we did, we drop this out so people can test their systems so they know what an attack looks like. Here's a concept. You just built the POC. You've done the attack. You know what it looks like. Drop all the defensive guidance along with it, right? Mandia will do a great job of including like YAR rules and all sorts of other defensive stuff. A couple other companies will say, okay, well, here's what it looks like with Suricata or here's a snort signature or something like that. But there's a lot of places where they're just like, 
Here's the POC. We did a great job on this blog right up. Here's the all the de dirty details of how the vulnerability works, how we built the exploit. Here's POC. Good luck. Like yeah. that's not helping anybody. Yeah, but but, but but yeah, so like I had to I had to come to terms with this too, because I used to be on the flip side of this where I had to defend giant enterprises and I got kind of annoyed at security researchers dropping like I I, I had a much different opinion on that flip side. And it's not because I went into vendor land or whatever that I suddenly came to whatever. But one reason why I play that silly Fortinet thing and I poke at these folks and, and I get very upset at things like Avanti is that what I have seen over a unfortunately long period of time is these POCs, the folks that do great research, they dig into things, they find real bugs in a genuine attempt to make things better. And then the vendors barely patch that bug. Like I've oh. seen some of the patches and they don't do a good job at the patching or they write an if then statement yeah. around something. And then they don't bother looking at their own code. Like there, we have basically all these vendors have gotten too damn lazy right now by waiting for bug bounty people to come in and say, this is another new thing that's wrong. And then they don't bother looking at anything else. Like it's there, yeah. there, this is like, this is squarely on like, the liability is squarely on the vendors. I'd it's say, like a forcing function oh, at this yeah. point. They like don't without have, it, they have no financial motivation to improve. Um, yeah, I, I, I definitely want to agree with you on that. It is completely on the vendors on this one. Um, my only point was, hey, researchers, do a better job of sharing. Like that, if you okay. know the vendors aren't going to do a great job of patching it, at least say, hey, this is what it looks like. So when the broken patch comes out, you know whether to text if you've been exploited without having to exploit your production systems, right? If I'm on the, the network side, oh, here's a POC. It works against all of my F5s. OK, well, I can't really test any of my production gear. And maybe I didn't have a lab where I can test a lab device. Gotcha. Right now, I'm like, well, what does an attack look like? I have to wait to see it. I don't even know what to put a log signature in for. Yeah, this is the thing that drives me nuts about the whole idea of like red team and blue team is I think that if you're good enough to be slaying out like red team stuff, like you're good enough to know like how to detect it on the other side. So if you're not yeah. maybe like partner with somebody who does, I really like that idea of if you're going to release a POC, like just, just talk about like what maybe directory it would show up in for a log. Like how do you even get started with looking for it? Yeah. It's not that hard. If you're, if you're testing an exploit, you've got a device virtual or real, you're throwing the exploit at it. Once it works, be like, okay, well now we know let's go. Let's, you know, oh, let's just do a like like a live tail the logs while you throw the exploit. Oh, look, we saw a signature coming. Cool. Right. This is what we saw on our lab device. Maybe not exhaustive, but say this is what we saw when this exploit happened. Like just something, because most of the time they, it doesn't even appear that they try to phone it in. Yeah, and I think like some of these bug bounty hunters do get like very frustrated with not getting the recognition from the company. Like this comment from Justin just now about they didn't work with me. Mm -hmm. uh, I think people get very frustrated and they're just like, well, I'm going to dunk on this cus this company. And that's yeah. the motivation there of just like, I found this, they didn't recognize it. They're bad. So I want to get this out into the world to prove that that company is bad at security. But yeah. there's that. Yeah. And there's also so much ego in our field, yeah. which is a different that, topic, I, I, but it's still a problem. I think that the, so I think in my personal opinion, and I, I appreciate what Justin's saying here because I have been on the, I have been MSRC. I, I talked to many people off the ledge of dropping POCs on Twitter because they didn't like what the wrong person had told them. And many times I was able to say, look, this is, you talked to the wrong person. You've got me. Let's, let's calm down. We've got this. Um, that doesn't happen as much anymore after I left. Uh, shameless self-promotion here. But more what I'm talking about is where the patches come out and it's, you know, hey, we patched this really bad thing. And then there's this, you know, there's this race of all the companies, you know, they've got, the, you've got the Rapid7, you've got Horizon3, you've got whomever else, Asset Node, these other companies are like, let's go figure out what the POC was for this thing that they just patched. That's the thing that kind of frustrates me. It's like, okay, you, that's great. I love reading those blogs. Those are my favorite. I have friends at Rapid7, I have friends at Horizon3. I'm not discounting any of what they do. But when I look at it from like, if I had to defend a network, what would have really helped me more than the exploit is this is what to look for in your logs because this is the here's the truth of it is this exploit that we just shared because it's super cool is going to be used in about six hours by a Chinese. Yeah. Well, there's a difference between like testing to see if you are fully patched to the vulnerability and testing to or researching and hunting to see if you've already been affected by it. 
Yes. And I think that's kind of the difference that you're highlighting there. Yes. Yeah, like he's like just the same. Give me the IOC C that they really that's 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 super important. And I yeah, believe help me. Like the like Horizon three and one of their recent ones did that. They said, here's the here's the here's how we took apart, I forget what it was, maybe Go Anywhere Manager or Fortra. One of the ones that they just Pick did. One. They actually published. They're like, yeah, here's some of what the IOC is. This is what we saw in the logs when this ran. So I was like, okay, cool. That's that's actually that's that's helping both people, right? That's helping both sides. So I also feel really strongly about this. So coming from kind of the defender world now very squarely in the security research world, as a defender, I didn't find security research particularly helpful in a lot of ways for my job. Now I would read posts, I would I would stay on top of things and want to learn about kind of what what the new hot interesting things were, but it didn't tell me how to actually go and like look for those things in my environment. Like I had to figure that out on my own, right? And so I think as a community, right? Like we're here one i mean we want to do cool stuff we want to do cool work we're fascinated with this but i think if we really want to be helpful like if you care about you like the second person plural you care about like actually making the internet a little bit safer like it's the burden is on us to kind of share that other side right like it's not just about like oh look at this cool new thing i figured out like no actually be helpful and and like share some of the iocs share at least a little bit of information so that defenders aren't left going well okay that's cool but what do i do yeah yeah no you're absolutely right and and it's hard because defenders the you know there's so many different things that they have to sort of be the, the attacker. Like, like, what is it? The attackers only have to win once the defenders have to win every single time. Yeah. Right. Um, there's so many different things that people have to shift gears. I mean, even, even as I was looking at things, I'm like, okay, so I know this world really well. I know these devices really well. And then it's like, okay, Avanti comes out and I'm like, okay, I had to, I mean, granted, once I finally exploited it and cracked it and took it all apart, I was like, oh, this is just another CentOS box, like an F5. But I have used the, been working in that world for, almost 20 years prior to good doing infosec full-time it took me a while like i and i don't have a sock and people blowing up and other incidents and somebody patty from accounting opened the wrong pdf to deal with i can just sit here do research all day and it still took me a day and a half to figure out everything that was going on so your point you're very valid it's it's we need to be doing a better job of, of the research needs to not stop at like here's the new technique that's the first half, right? It's like, would you buy, would you buy those, the red teaming groups that come in and it's like, Hey, we got in, we popped you, we got domain admin YOLO. If they, if that's all they do and they walk away, are you going to ever recommend them to your, your, your colleagues or to your other friends that you have in, in the industry? No, you're going to recommend the companies that like personally I have friends at Spectre Ops who do a great job of, they spend, they've told me that we spend more time writing the, what you need to do than we do getting in. They're like, you know, it's 10 times as much effort to say, here's how we got in, here's how you can secure things. They give a very long write up of, this is all the stuff that you can do better and here's how to do it. Not just weak passwords, overly permissive security groups. Oh, you had an Apple missing. Well, great, what? Like you did all, you found why I paid you to find this stuff. I and mean, in security research, maybe the companies aren't paying us, but our companies are paying us, right? So, I mean, to the best of my abilities, I try to make sure and even when we've disclosed vulnerabilities, uh, we found some stuff in these uh, baseboard management controllers a um, year and a half ago. We kind of took the stance of, we're not gonna drop POC. The vulnerabilities were so egregious, that they were so easy to find, and they were so like hard to patch because it's BMC firmware on server motherboards that there's no automated way to patch this. Um, you know, We don't know how many hundreds of thousands or millions of machines are infected by it. So we're like, look, this is what the vulns do. This is kind of how they operate but we're not going to drop full POC. Like, if you really care about this, go find it yourself, right? And so that, because there also wasn't really any defensive guidance, there wasn't any logs. <laughs> like, if you exploit this, like, there's zero, there's no, there's no way to know if you've been hit by this. So why would we make anybody's lives easier on the attacker side? The, um, the other reason why we were having Nate on, and th this was this is selfish. I'm just going to be be pure about this. It's completely <laughs> selfish, and I'm going to see if I can rotate some people around this instead. There we go. That's better. So yeah, we got so many cool. If you're watching, we have so many cool controls now. Thanks to our Overwatch. It's so cool. Um, so when when Nate went to Eclipsium, I'm sorry I said Ecclesium before. I, I thought about right. moving versus whatever. Um, yeah. and I should be thinking about the Eclipse because it's like what in like a couple of weeks. Yeah, but um, the you did something phenomenally cool like i mean you do that regularly but this was like super cool to me which was you took kev you broke it apart 
and you said, hey, like where where were these flaws? Because like you care deeply about you know firmware and things like that. So you like dissected it and came up with a completely different view than I've ever seen of Kev looking at it from one perspective. Can you talk a bit more about that to everybody? Yeah. Um. So this was this is actually the kind of the first project I did when I was at Eclipsium. I was heavily working on my low balance of research, but part of the the stuff I want to talk about was I was like, okay, CISA had for the first time, um, you know, started saying these are the stuff that we see being exploited. So and this was March, May of 2020, 2022, that time flies. Um, so I basically tell you at the time, the list was only like eight or 900 CVEs. So I was like, okay, this is like a day's work, an afternoon's work. So I just kind of went through it. But let me just break it out by categories, right? And so um, my explanation on categories is we'll go, so software libraries, this is essentially things like, you know, like libraries that you didn't like, you know, if there's like a libjpeg, that kind of thing, stuff that you would use inside other software packages, office applications, pretty self-explanatory application software. This is things that would be outside of Microsoft office suites, right? So some, a lot of times this is, so if it's something like Adobe Acrobat reader, or if there's even some stuff that's sort of middleware applications. Um, that's what I'll tag that as. I and, and like Chrome, like Chrome would be in that thing too, right? No, <laughs> no, no Chrome, really. Chrome, Chrome's not in there, really. Chrome I, Chrome, I put in web browsers. Oh, yeah, that's right. You have a whole category for that. Yeah. I forgot about yeah. That. yeah. So Chrome web browser protocol was actually new in, I think this, I don't remember, this must have been a graph that you got off our website because there's 2024 is trimmed off, but there's a, the, a protocol, I think it was an STP or SIP. There was a actual vulnerability in an internet protocol that I had never that hadn't that had been actively exploited, which was a first. Um, virtualization obviously would be hypervisors, um, drivers, obviously drivers, operating systems. The the thing that I was interested in was with firmware. Um, so like the actual full list, the majority I I have had de debates with people both internal and external as to whether I should call a network appliance device firmware. Um, I call it firmware because it runs an appliance, right? Granted, and if we, now I'm old school, back when I started doing this, it was Cisco iOS, it was a single file that you loaded on, you you know, put it under ROM on mode, you uploaded this thing, you said boot this bin file, it unpacked it. That was the firmware for the device. Now, um, we're actually for the last 20 years, all these vendors have been going with like, let's just run CentOS or FreeBSD and then slap a bunch of stuff on top of it. But I don't think calling a network appliance a, a server is really an appropriate like taxonomy. Plus, it looks better in our marketing standpoint because we're going after firmware as, you know, firmware is what we do for security, network device, operating systems, we'll call them firmware is another thing that we target. But the vast majority of things that are being exploited um, are in some sort of firmware, right? It's, it was amazing. It was surprising to me when I put all, I just kind of went through this whole list and then finally had it done, you know, as I'm getting like, you know, I've only got a hundred left. I'm like, oh man, I'm already thinking like, what are these bar charts going to look like? I'm really curious. And then pop it open and it's like, wow. Okay. So this is actually one of the most attacked categories of stuff. The one little bit that maybe that, that could be slightly misleading is we don't see a lot of exploitation of firmware itself on endpoints. Right. So like the actual exploitation, like other than, um, so like logo fail and pixie fail, those two pieces of research, that would be exploitation of firmware. Um, those were done in a research capacity, right? Those haven't been maybe in a month or in a year or two years, they'll show up on the CISA Kev list. Um, but for the most part, firmware, like the actual, you know, UEFI and your actual stuff in running inside your laptop, it's not being exploited, but it's being used for as a place to persist. So now if we look at the network side, yes, it's definitely the firmware that's being exploited. And it's funny because people say, you know, Linux, we all agree, is probably the far more secure server operating system than any other, which is great until you punch a bunch of crappy middleware on top of it and yeah. you use, like yeah. checking to see what a HTTP header is to determine whether you're authenticated or not. F5. <laughs> I mean, so, I mean, one thing about not seeing the exploitation of firmware, it's also because you it's difficult to literally see that kind of exploitation. Like the telemetry yeah. isn't there, which is kind of what we were talking about at the top. Yeah. Is it's, it more is happening, but tools aren't deep enough into the kernel or um, teams aren't, you know, like they're not there yet. They're still dealing yeah. with the lower hanging fruit or something. Yeah. But it's definitely happening more than what we see 
Which it's absolutely fun. happening more than mm -hmm. what we see. Like I said, give me, give me, if anybody from wants to give me CrowdStrike visibility or Defender visibility, let me know. <laughs> I'll, I'll, we'll have some very interesting research coming out of that. Cool. Uh, so I, I have bad news for our listeners. Uh, or maybe it's not bad news because I am going to try to to get all these cool folks back. Maybe maybe not Nate because Nate's got a real job. Um, oh, back in the blast. But uh, but we are not going to cover the, the the China stuff uh, because this has been such a great conversation, and I'm going to bring us all back to the main view if this will work. Hey, that worked great. So I'm going to I am skipping past. Although I, I I'm sorry I I spent time on this. And you I, got I, to show that image. I I, I have to show this because um, I had no idea that Glenn actually starred in Big Trouble in Little China. I had no idea until I was trying to find graphics for this. Yeah, maybe maybe that should alter your. Your, uh, your behavior towards me? It, it probably not. Um, so, so I'm going to try to get the gang together later this week. I don't know if they can commit to that to try to go over this because it's somewhat timely. Because I want to get to the rest of the to the the rest of the the stuff if we can. So I'm going to bring this back up here and do the cool. We got all the cool buttons. This is so cool. Um, and so Volncheck has released something, and I forget how how long ago this is. I'm sure Pat, if Patrick were on and actually typing, we would know. But Patrick's not here. Uh, I guess I could type into Slack and do that too. But a couple weeks ago, they uh, they released a bunch of community oriented things uh, that were previously only well one one didn't exist, and the other stuff was only if you were a paying customer of, of Volncheck. So the one is their, what they call Volncheck Kev. And what that is, it's their extended version of Kev because Volncheck knows about a lot of things that are exploited that, that CISA does not or doesn't fit into the same exact categories that, that CISA uses. It's just a difference and this is no, no shade against CISA. They do a great job. Uh, but this provides a lot of extra information about this and about things that they've had. And one thing that's really neat from, from digging into this, and I'll show you how to dig into it in a second, uh, they are always ahead of Kev. Um, so either they're fibbing, and I know the folks that work for Volncheck, so they're not, or they're they're getting like things that well, well before Kev says, hey, you should care about that. So that's one great thing. This is a community resource every enterprise can use. You, If you just hit this thing, you will probably be able to save yourself some time and maybe get ahead of what this is actually doing. And they've got a couple hundred more entries than them. I've been playing with the data for a couple of weeks now. Um, I mean, we were playing with our other data for longer than that, but I've been playing with this community version of it. And this is just, it's a phenomenal resource. So I, I really want to encourage p uh, folks to go do that. But then I want you to go and just explore the community APIs they have. Again, it's free. You sign up and you literally get everything and one of the one of the really cool things they've done is because like as we discussed at in depth last week and if you haven't heard that conversation you really should i glenn actually glenn wasn't here last week you did listen last week and like you can be mean glenn what, 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 did, did we do a good job on the nvd portion of it yeah it uh yeah i listened to it yesterday and it was funny enough because i haven't caught up on that um whole chain of events so it was a good catch up uh so yeah i'd recommend it cool i don't know I if mean, you want me to go into something specific on it or no i, I just like i because because you will be honest like if it sucked you would have told us so like i just want yeah. to, he, he will everybody so i wanted you to hear that from him <laughs> and the reason why i'm bringing that up is like there's a problem with nvd they're going to get rid of their json feeds which are there's really really useful for people like for doing and enterprises and data scientists doing work uh their api sucks it's slow it's intermittent it's whatever it covered we covered it last week and they've got two two interfaces to it one that returns the exact same information that the cve endpoint does at nvd so you get the exact same data the exact same way you want but there's also another one which will let you download the exact same nvd json files that you were from what they would expect from their feeds and it does it about 1200 times as fast as they do and there's it's really simple and straightforward to actually go use so i would really encourage folks uh, that are doing vulnerability management in their organization to please poke at this because you, it could save you a ton of time and it is completely free and they've, they've done a really good job with this uh this is a shameless self-promotion i threw together a quick little dashboard for for their stuff um mostly because i wanted to poke at it and see what was there and like let, let other people be able to explore it as well i'll be i'll be updating this and the code's available so anyone else can run their own dashboards on this if they want to actually go do that too so i just want to throw that up there uh, we don't have a lot of actually. I, I I know I did this before, and like you said, no. But I just gonna double check before we do ours. Nate, do you have any shameless self promotion blogs or anything for your organization you want to throw? Out? Oh, um, let me think here. We've got a few bunch, a couple ones that recently that were interesting. I mean, if you go to eclipsium.com, there's always something fun. Uh, I think the latest one we did was we uh, 
look at a uh, GTAC, a uh, ruggedized laptop that's used by like first responders and the military and basically mm. ripped apart the firmware on these things and found a whole bunch of security problems that could, um, you know, you've got a device that can stand being dropped uh, in a mud puddle that I can plug a USB in and take over your device. So that was a fun one. Um, we have some interest. We, we have a bunch of research sort of queued up that uh, will be coming out here in the next over the next few months. Um, if we're lucky, maybe some cool stuff at Black Hat. Um, but yeah, nothing. I would just say go check it out. We kind of cover the gamut of networks to devices to random weird devices. Um, so I would just say keep an eye out, stay tuned. You know, yeah, like all of the blog posts and research posts are extremely fun, and you'll everyone yeah. will learn a lot going through them. It's it's a really really great blog to follow. Like it's it's literally fun. Like they do a lot of cool things, like they with with the Star Wars one that I showed before. So they have, in my head good. right now is on one side reading this week about all of the like please to get rid of SQL injection. And then on the other side is Nate talking about like firmware is <laughs> terrible. And so like we are so far away from those two. Like oh, the... not as far as you might think, Glenn. All will be uh -oh. made, all will be made clear later in the summer. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Oh gosh, everything's broken. Um, we have, um, I, I, if Overwatch could just confirm this, this is, you still have time to join today's webinar on the future of honeypots. I believe it's this afternoon or hopefully it isn't going on at the same time. She, she can drop a little note maybe while I'm talking. Uh, at least sign up for it so that you can watch it on demand if you don't have time to watch it today. Uh, I've had a sneak, I have a sneak preview of what, what's going on in this one. And Lewis, the folks are doing a fantastic job with this. And this is a setup for a report that Lewis has been working on and other folks for a while now uh it's a great history of honeypots and also the future of them and gosh is it really good lewis is an amazing writer so please please like check on those things because it's it's you'll learn a lot from from those uh and it was a really fun fun read on top of that uh, i'm gonna do a tag roundup real quick again uh we have a lot of tags i'm sure there's probably three more since this one because the team I don't I don't know how to do it. I well, I make sake that's a lie. We do know how they do it. But like they they are just amazing. They they I don't know. We have we have like the coolest detection engineers on the planet. Sorry everybody else out there. They're just the best folks. And uh I am not going to dig into this too much, but just stay on the lookout for this and we'll cover it probably uh, if I can get everyone to do a special China episode. Um thanks to so Glenn has been prodding me to do something for a while um and uh, Brad on, in, in our organization has been prodding me to do something like this for a while with questions. Uh, it's great that you get a, a handful of days analysis of like what an IP has been doing and in a certain way. Uh, we've come up with a different way to look at how what IP addresses have been doing and all sorts of analysis on like like where how they flip, uh, like what they're doing from a, an activity standpoint, but I'm malicious or otherwise, or even ASN flipping as well too. So we're going to give you a lot more tools, at least in a beta version and test things out, see how this works with everybody. Uh, so I'll be working with our design team to make this semi-ugly thing look a lot better because like they're really good at that. And, and I, if, if they tell me what to do, I can actually do it. So we'll, we'll see what we can do there. Uh, we're going to talk about Kev briefly because they're apparently not dead. I thought maybe that there was like a gas attack at CISA and they had all died because I hadn't seen Todd on the internet for a while too. But it turns out that they're not dead, which which is great. And um, they they there's been one whole day since they did that. And of course, Fortinet, of course, Avanti, and it's been zero days. It's been there's one now, the one today. What was uh, it today? SharePoint. My, yeah, there's a SharePoint. Oh, of course, it's Share yeah. freaking point. Why, why do people still use that? Server oh. software. Yeah, it is yeah. so embedded in orgs. Yeah, yeah, I know. Um, uh, we we have some things to say about a couple of these things. So check our blog out for the, for those things. Uh, but it's it's been it's been a fun a, a fun a fun. Wait, how long was the so? What I think you analyzed. It took three weeks for one to show up. How many days was it, Glenn? Before between what's the question? Be, how many days between? Like, so we had a gap in Kev. How many days was that again? Oh, it was uh, eighteen. I think it was eighteen days. It was eighteen the second longest, days. Eighteen second days. Second longest span. Which is good news, to be fair. Like, we kind of joke about it. It's great if Kev isn't adding things to Kev because that means they're not exploited. But it's also weird because we're like, well, they're not known exploit. Whatever. Like asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Um, but it's also just weird when we see a outage like that because it's not normal. Yeah, I mean, just well, so I mean, I, I am going to be throwing up some analysis of what what Vonchek seems to think, like their view on exactly exploited and Kevin to overlay that. So that should be pretty viewed. Out. Give them give them a break, guys. They did have one of their Avantis get hit, right? I mean, <laughs> this is true. This is, maybe they were doing IR. Oh, that's that's so mean. That is that is so mean. Um, 
Well, cool. So we we are going to close this thing out. Uh, Nate, I appreciate you carving out this much time to talk with. It wasn't just this; and it was a set of time and everything. This has been great. I really appreciate you doing this. Yeah, I'll, I'll come back anytime. You guys are you guys, you folks are great. <laughs> and so I'm going to start with you. Um, if you could open a door to another dimension, what is the first thing you'd hope to see on the other side? Oh, I was thinking about this one. So, what I would hope to see if I open a door to another dimension was that I was an interdimensional traveler and this is just one of the dimensions I was visiting. Essentially, That's very essentially, close to my answer. He always yeah, does this. He always piggybacks off the clever folks. He I always have, does this. I have, oh, well, I have. You Yeah, because you just jotted it down while he was talking. Yeah. No. <laughs> Mine's a little different. I'll get into mine in a second. Go ahead. I'm just, that's fascinating. Cool. Oh, that's a great answer. That's an awesome answer. Uh, Kimber, do you next? What about you? If you could open up a dimensional door, what would you want to see? Nature, but in whatever other dimensions, like version of it is. Like, I want all mm -hmm. the weird leaves. Or, like, are they even leaves? Like, what I want to open what? the door and experience, like, whatever that dimension's version of the Windows XP background is. <laughs> Continuing a theme, if anyone for a long time listens, yeah. that's pretty cool. Uh, since I want Glenn to have time to make up a new one, uh, Emily, um, <laughs> if you could open up a dimensional gateway, what would you want to see? So this kind of borrowing from Kimber's, I would love to see a world where there's just like lots of chihuahuas running around the Windows XP background. Aww. I just want chihuahuas. Oh, chihuahua universe. Yeah. It sounds loud. loud. Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it sounds loud. loud. Very it, energetic, very where, shaky. I mean, not not to get gross, but where does the the, the stuff go? Because there's a, there's, a lot of problems, there's a lot of stuff. A different, a different thread of a different dimension. Okay. All right. Mm. Oh, it's like there's like a door to one that just that goes to maybe. Yep. Like disposal. Yeah. Oh, there's no I, rules, right? It's like that place to be if you're there, but otherwise. Cool. <laughs> Um, and since Glenn still has to make up one. Um, no. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I was going to do our watchers. Go ahead. My, no, it was more like, I don't know if everyone watches Rick and Morty, but how there's like infinite timelines, infinite like peop, like stories happen at the same time. And, then, and so basically every decision has happened differently. Like it just sprawls out. Like I would want that kind of like I want to open that door and see like the infinite timelines and, you know, uh, dimensions of where every decision went differently. That'd be wild. Thank you. Cool. Overwatch. What about you? You got to have something. Puppies, talking, talking puppies. puppies. That sounds terrifying. Talking puppy that universe. Great. I love but it. But then they can't keep secrets. This this whole conversation is like a Rick and Morty episode. You realize that. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah. <laughs> to a large degree. Um, I actually would like to open up a dimensional door and see the Tron dimension on the other side. I wanted to see, I wanted to actually see the Tron dimension ever since I first saw the movie as a kid. And I really, really want to see the Tron dimension right now. I want to be able to walk into the. I don't even care if I turn into the Tron thing. I don't care. I just want to see the Tron. And dimension. it's OG Tron, not Tron. OG, oh yeah, OG Tron. Oh, OG Tron. Yeah, yeah. It feels like you know, like an Apple Vision Pro would get you there or something. Yeah. Now I want to be there though. Like I actually want to physically be there. I don't want to walk into a wall. I want to. What is the electricity? I want to watch like... you walk into a wall. <laughs> I. I so. Body problem. I, well, actually, yeah, everyone should watch that. We actually started, like, I don't watch a lot of things, but I started watching that because the books were great. And they're not doing a bad job. They're not doing a bad job at all on that one. Um, to, truth be told, Glenn, when, when I had the Oculuses, I, I may have twice ran into a wall. So, oh, okay. Um, yeah, so, like, that's why. I mean, the, the Vision Pro is a little different, but that's what's there. All right, cool. This, is, this has been a great discussion. Uh, Nate, thank you so much again for, for carving out the time to do this. And we are Thanks definitely have, we are, you are coming back, dude. You are so cool. Excellent. Yeah, sorry we didn't get to everything that we talked about getting to. Well, actually, I'm not sorry that we didn't because this was a great conversation. Yeah. Um, and, and but again, I'm, if anyone I'm tuned in for, back. Yeah. if anyone tuned in just for China Talk, you'll have to uh, come Maybe back. this week, maybe another two episode week if I can get everyone to come in another 45 minutes or so. Maybe. maybe. You guys find me at zero dark 30 on the West Coast, so I'm never busy at this time. <laughs> that's true wow you are sacrificing early time for this too that's amazing yeah. all right cool well uh thanks to all the great contributions from everybody again in the in the in the comments keep doing that we, we love to hear that and we will catch everybody again on the next storm watch maybe even this week take care everybody bye